There are actually a lot of people in my family who are involved in Bible translation or were at some point in time. So I thought it would be fun and interesting to put together a series that tells their stories. Each one is unique and my hope is that this will give you a window into some of the history of Bible translation and the different experiences and challenges that people have faced, especially here in Mexico. I'm Andrew Case. Let's get started. Before we begin with this first interview, let me give you a little context and tell you what to expect from this series. Both of my grandparents were involved in Bible translation, three sets of uncles and aunts, as well as my own parents. So I'm a third generation Bible translation worker, and so far I'm the only one of my siblings and cousins who has gone this direction. We're going to start with my grandpa Edward Case, my dad's dad, who is 101 years old and now lives in California. I got my uncle Jim, who lives nearby, to ask him some questions about his brief involvement in Bible translation and subsequent missionary work in Cuba during the decade or so before Fidel Castro took over. Although his time working towards Bible translation in Mexico was cut short by World War II, it's interesting to hear the trajectory of his life and the way God used him and his family. Well, while I was a student in Biola, we were exposed to a lot of missionaries, and uh, they told of their experiences on the mission field and how valuable their work was in getting the message of salvation out to the un- unreached. As I listened to those missionaries and as I read books on, on mission experiences, I just felt that the Lord was calling me to join their forces, and so I did. There was one saying, why should anybody hear the gospel twice when there are so many have not heard it once? And that pulled the trigger. Boy, I, I was set hmm. for the mission field. So um, why did you first decide to get involved in Bible translation? And how did you hear about Wycliffe? We felt that it was so important to get the Bible and the news of salvation, you know, in the people's languages. And I got acquainted with Wycliffe Bible translators who made it well known that there were thousands of tribes in the world that had never had one word of God's word and nothing to encourage them to receive Christ as Savior. And did you did you hear about Wycliffe at the time when you were in Biola? Yes. And so, like, when you finished at Biola, you and Mom went down to Mexico, and that was with Wycliffe, right? Yes. Okay. So what was uh, SIL, linguistic training, like for you back then? And did you enjoy it? And who were some of your favorite professors? Uh, Linguistic training was right down my alley. And I was always interested in different languages. And while I was at Biola, even I sang in a a chorus for... for, uh, Gospel recordings? Gospel recordings. Oh, yeah. So I, I had a, a real interest in, in working in the Spanish language because I had had some good Spanish teaching in, in high school. The linguistic training was really wonderful. And Ken Pike and, and Eugene and Ida, they were two of the great professors that we had. Hmm. And they were excellent. And where was SIL back then? That wasn't Norman, Oklahoma, was it? Was that? That's where we had linguistic training. Now, you, you uh, just for our, our listeners, you were born in 1921. Yes. You're 101 years old. Yes. You grew up during the Depression. Yes. And, and you, you had to do a lot of like field work and, and picking, picking crops and stuff. Were you exposed to, like, migrant workers from Mexico and stuff in, at that time, or was that no, never. Not, not so common back no, then, huh? No, Okay. Any of the Mexicans were having enough trouble in their own country. Oh, okay. We, we, we didn't hardly ever see them here. Okay. So why did you go to Mexico as opposed to another country? 
Well, the experience that we had had with the, with the Mexican mission gave us an appetite for doing mission work amongst those people. Mm-hmm. That had a, a large share of, of uh, getting us ready to, to go there. And it was easy accessible. Yeah. Because we're living in Los Angeles, we were just a few miles from, from the border. And after Mom and I were married, we went directly to Mexico. So, I mean, you didn't just go to, like, Ensenada or Mexico City. You went to a little Indian village down down kind of near Acapulco area, right? Well, it's, we headed it, for Mexico City, yeah, where we received a lot of good information. And uh, then we were assigned to the Amuzco tribe in the state of Guerrero. So that's... That's where we went. So in Mexico City, was it like a training? Like, did you yes. initial training? Yes. Uh, to 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 prepare well, you for specifically that tribe, or was it no, just to know what we were facing because we we, <clears throat> we were going to a, a tribe that we didn't know the language, but we were going to have to use our linguistic training to hear their language, write it down, make a dictionary, and form a grammar, and it was quite a task ahead of us, but Betty and I had graduated with a medical mission course, and so we we were prepared to do medical work as well. Mm. And I think we did more of that than we did any translation. Mm. Mm-hmm. And of course, we it was during war, and we weren't down there very very long, but uh, we endeared ourselves to the people through the medical treatments yeah. that we were able to give them. That kind of opened some doors for oh, you. Oh, absolutely, huh? yeah. Wow. So they taught you how to do vaccinations and injections and in Biola at, at Biola yes. and first yeah. aid and and yeah. And then uh, you, you, yeah. I remember you telling us about mom. You know, doing a lot of the smallpox vaccinations. And, oh yeah. And a lot of the the kids that basically were saved because of anti scorpion injections. Yeah, because oh. the scorpions would would drop down out of the, yeah. the thatched roofs and at night and sting yeah. the kids. Right, they were a ter- terrible menace. So where did you get the anti scorpion or the antidote? They got it through the uh, Department of Health in Mexico City. Oh, okay. So you just took plenty of supplies with you, huh? Yeah, we took it for ourselves. Oh, okay. Because we, we were facing those poisonous little devils. Wow. But uh, we never were troubled with them. So uh, what village and people group did you go to when you first went to Mexico? Well, we went to the Amuzco tribe. Uh-huh. And that was in Sochisla, Vaca, Guerrero, 8,200 miles southeast of Acapulco. It was nighttime when we arrived in the privilege. We had flown from Mexico City down to Ometepec, and Ometepec was the, our start out out the path to uh, to Sochislavaca. And this was that during for, on horseback or horse donkey and, and and donkeys. And we had, we had a, a one of the Wycliffe gals with us to allocate us. She was a big gal, yeah, and intimidating. <laughs> and it was a good thing because. The president of the of the village came out with a shotgun, oh and he had it pointed right at our faces. And she took a hold of the barrel and said, "Don't you point that in our faces!" <laughs> wow! Oh my goodness! <laughs> wow! What an eye opener! Boy, we spent that first night in a place where they had the their parade cart, where they parade the the parade of the Virgin Mary around the village oh. on certain days. I saw a big black scorpion, or not, a big black tarantula going up the wall, and I got my little hatchet out and smashed it. Wow. And I didn't have very many quiet, restful moments after that. <laughs> but uh, we made it oh. through the night, and the next day, why well, we decided, you know, what, what we would be doing. What, what, what was the reception like as far as the people in general there? Were they pretty welcoming? and? Not necessarily. But as they found out what we could do for them medically, we endeared ourselves to uh, them. Yeah. Yeah. And predominantly, the Catholic Church was already pretty well established yes. at that time yes. in, in the village. Yes. Okay. And they and weren't happy with our arrival. That wasn't a very welcome... No. Not a welcoming no. Uh, group? No. Okay. So, uh, next question is, uh, what are some of your memories of what the indigenous language was like? I guess that would be the Amuzco language. 
And was that pretty daunting to learn? I mean, there's no similarities with that in Spanish. <laughs> well, if you face any language without knowing anything about it, it's daunting. But uh, little by little, we, we began to pick up words and phrases. Like uh, when we would greet a man, we would say, I would say, Shuman Dure. And if I met a woman, I would just say, Shuman Dure. Shumandu. But I made a mistake one time of, made, of the, saying Shumandu Shu, and that was a no-no. But it was a, a beautiful little language. I didn't learn until sometime after that it was tonal, so that added a, a, another difficult thing to, mm. to learning the language. But w we learned quite a little bit between Spanish and, and Amuzco, why we made ourselves understood pretty well. So the people that were bilingual in Spanish and in Musco, did you rely on them quite a bit to kind of get introduced to yes. the culture and language? Yes. And were they pretty helpful? I mean, did how was their, what was their attitude like? Uh, were they Catholic and, and yeah, resistant Catholic. to helping you? Or was and it? of course, they'd, they'd been told by the bishop, you know, that the Protestant devils were there in their midst. Oh, and really? Just to be oh, careful, okay. You know. Huh. Okay. But when they found out that we had medical ability yeah. know, to serve them, and we didn't charge anything, so they let us alone. They didn't. They didn't bother us. Huh. And of course, things that we had to buy in the in the town, it was with the Hispanics, you know, Spanish speaking. So they had to treat us well. So, what was your adjustment to Mexico? And village life, like, so you hadn't been to a foreign country at that point, right? Mm -hmm. This is your first exposure to another culture and yeah. another country. So what was that like, just all of a sudden being thrust into yeah. Mexico and then the village? Well, fortunately, at Biola and also with Wycliffe, we were wonderfully oriented into what we might be facing. And missionaries from other organizations had gone to fields and completely collapsed because they weren't they weren't trained mm -hmm. and they weren't they didn't get heads up of what 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 to expect and so they crashed every little new thing that that came up in our experience with with the Amuzgos we knew how to handle it and then it was good to have read books and and heard missionaries talk mm. and uh, to realize what they faced when they went to the mission field. It, it helped us immensely. It was just like handing the church over to us, hmm. and we knew how to run. Yeah. So did you, how did you figure out, like, how did you learn about social norms in the village, like what to do and not to, not to do, or what to say and not to say? Like I had a good informant. When questions like that would come up, I would ask him, yeah. and he would tell me. So I was I was prepared for, but there really weren't any big things. We had a wonderful time with the kids, and I can remember taking eight and a half by eleven sheets of used paper and making little airplanes for them. Oh boy! And they would throw those airplanes, and they just got a big kick out oh of that. Oh my goodness! They called an airplane an air house. Oh, huh, <laughs> huh. So it was wow. a house that could fly in the air. <laughs> yeah. So now what, what exposure to airplanes did they have? Were, were airplanes weren't flying out to the village at that point, were they? Uh, not yet. Yeah. But uh, the men of the village were preparing uh, an airstrip. And one morning I went out with them to help work on, the, on, really? the, on that airstrip, which impressed them. <laughs> and the uh, postman... <clears throat> who was bilingual, he asked me, he says, Lalo, por que esta aquí? Why are, why are you here? And I said, I, I'm here to give you God's word in your language because God has a very important message for you. It'll tell you how to live. It'll tell you how to expect what'll happen after you die, that he has a place prepared in heaven for you if you're willing to receive uh, him as your savior. And he just listened very intently. And then he went and told the workers what I had said. So they knew why we were there. That's um, really cool. And that was very well respected. So, Dad, how long were you in the Amusco village, and what eventually took you elsewhere? Well, we were in there four or five months. 
one day I got a call that the Army wanted me to come and serve. <laughs> and so I felt that it was was my duty to, to do that as, a, as an American citizen. And so I made the decision to, to leave and to go home and sign up and get into the service. So, so you guys came back to San Francisco, yes. and then Mom stayed in San Francisco. And it with- took time f- for the draft board, which was in Los Angeles, uh, to transfer up to San Francisco. And it, it took a long time. And so I looked for employment, you know, and uh, so there was an opening in Mare Island Naval Station, and I went over there and, and worked until I got called up. Okay, so you worked on the submarines and yes. helping with the. What was your What was your job there? Sheet metal. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. So you worked on all the like the in insides of the submarine and yes. refabricating. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And so, how did how in the world did they contact you when you were in the Musco Village to 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 let you know that you were being called up? Well, they did it through our headquarters in Mexico City. Okay. And I was two weeks AWOL by the time I got the message. Oh, two weeks. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so where did you end up serving then? Well, after my basic training in Fort Hood, Texas, I was sent to Seattle, Washington. And I was there for hmm, probably three weeks. And then we got the call to go out to the far Pacific. And I ended up in the Marianas Islands on Saipan and Tinian. Okay, so you uh, you were in the military then for a couple years. You came back. Why didn't you end up going back into Bible translation? Well, I thought that, I thought that we would. But Dawson Trotman, who was, I guess, on the board of Wycliffe, they had decided that I hadn't made enough progress in the Amuska language, but how do you make much progress when you're doing mission medical work? And, right. <laughs> and and in just short months. Seven or eight months, yeah. yeah. So he said, that's that's why we're not sending you back. I said, okay. So you were in San Francisco. You came back and, and you know, mom was in San Francisco with her mom and Faith. and Yeah. And then so you were, you were here for a little bit. Dan was born yeah. in 47. Yeah. And then, so then, then what happened? How did, how did you end up going to Cuba, and what was that? How, what? Well, we were looking for more missionary activity, and child evangelism was, was open. I was on the board in San Francisco. It kind of came to us that maybe there's an opening in, in the mission field with child evangelism. Soon we were on our way to the Child Evangelism Institute in uh, Santa Monica, and so we took the training there. Well, I took the training. Mom had to take care of the kids. That was a grueling experience. Hmm. But we we did it, and then we went back to San Francisco. And what was grueling about that experience? The, the fact that well, we were we were renting quarters with a with an old woman. Yeah. And she was kind of cantankerous. Oh. During that time, I was working with North American ad, uh, Aviation. Yeah. I got a job in the sheet metal. Oh, and wow. So I, I walked, worked on a lot of parts for the first jet planes that they, wow. they manufactured. I did my work so well that the, the foreman said, Case, any time you want to come back to work, hmm. you, you got my back. Hmm. Wow. So, But I never... Cool. Never wanted to go back to that. Yeah, you ended up going to Cuba. But one one thing I wanted to ask you too was you, when did you learn ventriloquism, and and did you learn that with the view of using that in your child evangelism ministry, or or was that kind of like independent? No, absolutely. I was walking down the street in, in uh, Glendale, and uh, there was a store there. It had kind of magic tricks and. And oh. stuff, and there was a book in there on ventriloquism, and I said, "Man alive, that would be a wonderful tool to use, you know." Uh-huh. And so I I got it, and I started reading through it and trying to figure out how I could make a doll hmm. and uh, and use it. And all that time I was 
in teacher training. Yeah. And one time I was with a, a group of ladies out. I, I told them, you know, what I was planning to do and to use ventriloquism, you know. And Of course, I had to get a doll and, and all that. She said, well, you don't have to do that. I've got a little Charlie McCarthy I'll give to you. Oh, boy. So she gave me wow. Charlie McCarthy. Wow. And that was Poncho, right? No. No. no oh, this was, was before McCarthy. Poncho. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. And so Charlie soon got converted. Yeah. And <laughs> and I took him to, to Cuba with us. Huh. And I I used him real well. Yeah. Uh, Carlitos, that's what he was at that, there. But one day, I had been practicing with him, I guess, and he was out of the suitcase, and he was on one of the pews in the church in Haruko. Yeah. And the pastor's son was in there. And while I was talking to the pastor, he went over and picked up the doll. Oh. And, of course, it, it didn't have a very firm neck connection ahead to the body. Oh, no. And... I don't know what he did, shook it or something, and, and the head fell off. Oh, brother. And he was horrified, and so was his dad. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that was the death of Carlitos. Oh, so that broke, he, he, that broke him, huh? Oh, yeah. Then when we went home on furlough, I told about that experience in the, the men's Sunday school class in Church of the Open Door. Of course, I was looking to, to get a new doll. One of the uh, elders of the church and he was a, a builder hmm. and immensely wealthy and he said ed he said how much would it cost to to get a new doll mm -hmm. well i had that all figured out huh. 80 bucks and so i got poncho lopez and he was a, a really wonderful tool yeah and a lot of kids came to know the lord through if they're him mm. there's one little boy came to sunday school and Listen to the the lesson, and, and I had I had asked Pancho. I said, "What's what's the greatest thing that you want for all these kids, Pancho?" He said that all of them come to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Mm. And this little kid went home and he had remembered all that. Wow! And he came back the next Sunday to his <clears throat> Sunday school teacher and he said, "Teacher, I want to receive Christ as my Savior." She said, "Why do you want to do that?" Because Pancho said I should. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> so, huh. so that was one gem. Boy, <laughs> you sure had a, a a great routine. I mean, you're the jokes and and the, the the conversations that you had with Poncho were so were so engaging and so yeah. riveting. You know, yeah, it was always so much fun. I learned early on that you never get the the doll down. You don't insult him, but he can get you. He can insult you. <laughs> yes. And he did several times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like one time I, he, I introduced him and he says, I'm the ventriculist. <laughs> I said, what? You, you didn't pronounce that word right. It's ventriloquist. Yeah, that's what I said, ventriculist. <laughs> I said, if you're the ventriloquist, what does that make me? The dummy. <laughs> That was so good. Uh, I remember the kids just roaring. Oh, you know, I know. They just they just died laughing when they heard that. That was so good. <laughs> but that was meant to be. Yeah. And the kids, you'd be their enemy if you got the best of it all. Yeah, yeah. But they can make fun of you. And then sometimes, uh, of course, he had controls. You know, he could close his eyelids, and he could wink. And uh, so I said, well, you Join me in prayer. So so let's go to prayer. Bow your heads. And then Pancho would open one eye. <laughs> and there's one little kid down there said, Pancho opened his eye. <laughs> oh, Pancho, <laughs> what on earth? What were you doing opening your eye? I was just looking around. That was great. I, I, can, I can still remember that. <laughs> yeah. I was in a church substituting for a missionary that didn't show up, couldn't show up because of health, I guess. I went up on the platform with my my suitcase, and people wonder what on <laughs> what is going on here. I just very casually opened the suitcase and and pulled out Pancho. And Pancho looked at me. He said, "Place this, this place is sure dead." <laughs> I said, well, what can we do to liven it up? 
I'll sing a song. All right, you go ahead and sing a song. I've got to have a accompanist. Oh, you want a accompanist? Huh? All right, well, somebody will come down, play the piano, and you'll sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. So a girl comes down one aisle, and the guy down there, they had two pianos. You know? Oh, yeah. And he said, just, just the gal will do. <laughs> <laughs> that broke the ice. The congregation <laughs> just went berserk. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> oh. oh boy, that's uh, great. Oh. And of course, it was a new kind of Spanish that, that we that we, that we didn't really know. Yeah, it was fast, fast as a machine gun. But we soon got accustomed, and we got allocated in our house down in San Jose de las Lajas. We had a little class of of kids. I wasn't as conversant in Spanish as I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. But uh, it didn't take too long to learn and to really be able to express myself. We had a little group of children, and we taught them uh, the word in some of the lessons that we had. There was uh, one little girl that stood out from the rest, and we kind of guided her in her spiritual life. I guess it was at that time that her little brother was very, very ill. So... They came to me to see if I could come and, and do anything, you know, medically or, huh. or anything for, for that little boy. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'll, I'll go and, and see what I can do. And so I, I, the little kid was just, you know, in the last moments of his life. While I was there, they called the doctor. The doctor came and said, well, I'll go ahead and make out the, the thing of, of death. Wow. And... Uh, so I quickly got the kids aside. I said, you know, the Lord Jesus is able to raise up the dead. And he raised up Jairus' daughter. And I said, do you believe that the Lord Jesus can raise this little boy up? Hmm. See, unanimously. Hmm. So we prayed. And before we got through praying, that little boy cried. Wow. My goodness. And the doctor went away and he came back and he said, this child had died. Wow. And he was alive. My goodness. And he lived. Wow. And that was that was certainly a wonderful experience. Wow. Well, that's the first time I've heard that one. Really? Man. Oh, boy. Wow. Wow. And that, we had a very good little class out of, out of those kids. There was another missionary with a different mission living in uh, uh, Los Pinos, Nuevos, uh, that was a Bible school down in the western part of Cuba. He decided to make a trip across Cuba, and he had a lot of tracts and things. And then he, he said, Case, would you like to go with me? Huh. I said, I'd be delighted to do that. So he came by San Jose de las Lajas, and I was ready to go with him. He had this old Harley with a sidecar on it and loaded with tracts. Wow. <laughs> and so we started out, and I don't know how many times we bro we stopped because of a broken chain on the motorcycle. Oh, really? Oh, boy. And then we had to scrunch around and find <clears throat> the links and get it back together and get on wow. our way. But we threw out tracks as we went, and we saw men get down off of their horses loaded with groceries to pick up the track wow. and read it. Huh. So eternity will reveal wow. how many might have received Christ. Yeah. You know? hmm. So we went clear down to Santiago de Cuba. <coughs> that was the eastern hmm. part of the island. Did a little preaching in the church down there and tell them what we were doing. Hmm. And then we headed back back home. Hmm. So what were what were some of your favorite things about Cuba? Good food. <laughs> Lechon asado. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roasted <Yeah>. pork. <laughs> yeah. And yucca, the way they made it. Mm, oh, yeah. my goodness, it was so good. With the garlic sauce oh, and yeah. drizzled over it. And oh. it yeah. yeah, the mojo. <laughs> You're making <Yeah>. me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you find the people there when you first went to Cuba, were, were they pretty welcoming and oh, yes. receptive? Completely. Of course, it was mostly in Christian circles that, that yeah. we were moving. But they were easy to get along with and just lovely people. 
So, so you went in '49. You were there for ten years before Castro took over. Yeah, uh, he took over in '59. The revolution. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about the your experience with the Cuban Revolution and and what was it like to slowly find out that Castro was a bad man <laughs> and uh, and that he was evil and what finally made you guys leave Cuba? What was the exodus like? We knew that uh, something was looming on the horizon because Batista was corrupt and in a lot of his cabinet were corrupt. And it looked like uh, Fidel Castro was going to come in and change things. And we didn't realize what a communist he was. Mm. But uh, the day finally broke when he attacked Moncada there in the, in the eastern part of Cuba. So we endured a year and a half under Castro's rule because he had taken over and he had a lot of, a lot of guys, they called them barbudos because they all had beards. Mm. And uh, so they, they took over the, the government and so we just had to kind of bide our time and see what was going to happen. Mm. But it was very difficult because we were <laughs> some of those damned Yankees. Mm. And mm. Uh, So it was a hostile environment from the get-go, or did it kind of increasingly get that way? It, it increasingly got that way, yeah. yeah. What I remember you telling about how, how the communists influenced the kids in the schools. Can you tell about that? Well, one thing, at Christmas time, they usually, you know, celebrated the coming of the wise men with gifts. Yeah, and now it was uh, there was a a guy from Argentina, Che Guevara, mm. and uh, he was put in with the three kings. And he was the one that was going to be bringing the gifts, and they did bring a lot of gifts for uh, the kids, mm. and this influenced them quite a bit. And eventually, the teaching was completely changed mm. to favor the communists. Hmm. And the kids were being brought up in that kind of an environment. And I, I, I remember you talking about the kids in the classroom that they were, they were told to pray to God for ice cream, and of course nothing came. And then they would pray to Castro, and then they'd bring ice cream in. Is that exactly? Is that, is that That's what they exactly would exactly what happened? Yeah. Great way to win the hearts, huh? Oh yeah, boy. Yeah, talk about Castro is more powerful than God. Boy, the, the great deceiver was at work. Yeah. Our living conditions under communist rule were fast changing, and uh, we were going to have to do some kind of an economic uh, thing, and we decided that it would be better for us to leave, and we knew that the last ferry out of Havana for Key West was about to take place, and uh, so we loaded up our station wagon <laughs> with what things we could take with us. I guess it was kind of an honor to be on there at the same time that Hemingway and his wife and daughter were, uh -huh. were leaving at the same time. Uh -huh. So what advice would you give to someone considering going to the mission field today? Well, the call of the church is to go and spread the gospel to all the world. And that hasn't happened yet. So the field is opened. The harvest is great. Mm -hmm. The laborers are few, but it takes uh, very courageous people mm -hmm. to prepare themselves and go to unknown places and preach the gospel of good tidings mm -hmm. and the salvation through Jesus Christ. I would say to students who are in Bible schools and seminaries, go for it, because the Lord has promised never to leave us nor forsake us, and he'll go before us with his banner of love and protection, and he has thousands of angels to watch over us while we go to these different fields. And there are a lot of languages that haven't been translated yet. The legacy of children impacted by my grandparents' ministry in Cuba is large. A number of years ago, my parents were able to visit the country and see with their own eyes how many people and churches are a result of the seeds they planted. A big thanks to my Uncle Jim for making this interview possible, and of course, a big thank you to my grandfather for taking the time to share with us. This is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, 
God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, Sweeter Than Honey and Pointing to Jesus. Jesus.